Hey everybody. So today I want to talk to you about optimizers and specifically the Atom Optimizer. I hear a lot of kind of misconceptions and a lot of misinformation around optimizers, how they work, why the Atom Optimizer is the best optimizer, is there a better optimizer, etc. And so kind of the bottom line, starting at the beginning, um, AI and neural networks were originally designed 100% to mimic the brain and the brain processes. Uh, and then during the 1980s, there was a process introduced called backpropagation, which is what Jeffrey Hinton just recently won the Nobel Prize for. And within that process of backpropagation, which is not a natural process at all, so that's the bottom line within this, right? Backpropagation doesn't exist within any sort of biological organism. It's a major shift away from AI and from neural networks as opposed to biological networks. Uh, biological networks don't have this process. And then so it's, it's natural to not understand and have questions about processes related to this because there's no biological equivalent to it. So within the backpropagation process, we'll get more into this, but the optimizer process is a part of and lives within that backpropagation process. It's a part of this uh, uh, it's a part of AI that is non-biological. There's no biological equivalents. There's no equivalent uh, animal uh, equivalent in the brain, anything like that to this exact process, which again, it makes it easy for me to understand why this particular process can be confusing for people. So let's break it down and dive into um, optimizers and then get into the atom optimizer specifically. So we have to start off with how exactly neural networks work. And we'll start off with forward propagation. With forward propagation, it's very straightforward, right? You have a input layer, uh, and then usually in input layers, and then hidden layer layers, and then one output layer, and then information is fed forward. And then in this mathematical equation, it looks like a lot, right? But it's really just um, the activations and weights. So A1 and like A1 and W11 would be weight 11 and A1, A10, W11, 1, etc. And then so it's just adding and multiplying these different weights together. And then that produces an output, right? And then so if it's 2 plus 2, then it passes the input equation of 2 plus 2 over every single one of the weights. So A10 gives an answer, and then that answer is multiplied by A20's answer, which is added and multiplied by A30's, A31's answer, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then it kind of just builds and builds and builds. And then that's forward propagation. Your answer, your answer is the conglomeration of all of those things. And so backward propagation is a slightly different concept than that. So we have four propagation. That whole process exists, right? Uh, two plus two, and then we get our output, and then our prediction is three. And then uh, the output, so we take that three, and then we know that the actual answer is four, and then we feed that back through the model. So we say, okay, you predicted three, and the actual answer is four. And then, so let's feed that back through the weights. So all of the weights now know that next time the answer should be four. And then, so that's all that happens with the backpropagation process. Very straightforward in that instance, right? What's occurring there? And then, so when you put all of this together, essentially you get a neural network, what we're looking at here, and that whole entire process. And then so this entire process, like so this uh, adding the, the uh, predictions plus the true values into the loss function, computing the loss score, having the optimizer then optimize the weights based off of the loss score, that entire process is not biological, right? This is a, all like, um, consider like, all of the the uh, standard weights and all of this attached together, this is like your standard like neural network, like the standard brain, right? And then this is like a uh, a bolt-on to a brain, right? Like a bolt-on process, a whole entire new process. And then the optimizer process is just the red part of the, this process. It's just the part that's computing the loss score and then combining that to the weights. And then that's all that the optimizer does, right? Is it takes the loss score. So uh, in this instance, uh, we have um, 
Again, uh, let's say two plus two, and then our output is three. So our prediction y is three, and our true value y is four. It feeds that in. It computes a loss score. Let's say the loss score is one. Uh, and then the optimizer then it translates that and then gives that information back to the weights and then says, hey, you were off by one. You were off by one. You were off by one. Maybe some of the weights weren't off by one. Maybe some of the weights were off by two. Maybe some of the weights were accurate, right? And that's why the optimizer goes through and it feeds and then it, it essentially gives it a roadmap to uh, move forward. Here's exactly how you should be progressing within this. And then the next step of uh, understanding within this is to understand how exactly this information is stored within the LLM model, right? Because it's not storing words. It's not storing like math per se, etc. It's uh, a graph like this, a 3D graph, a flat out 3D graph, right? And then all of this information is on these different graphs and then the, the weights are in these different graphs in different places, etc. And then so with the loss function, what it's trying to do is say that like the answer is at the very bottom, like whichever one of these valleys is the deepest, that's where the actual answer resides, right? That's what we want to try to find. Uh, and then we're just going to search for that very bottom, uh, whatever is the very bottom of these valleys. And then this is like hills, right? Imagine like this is like a series of hills. And it's like, let's say like, like it's like a mountain range, right? And then the hills are different sizes and then they all, they dip down and then some of the valley dips different and it's like not a steady valley floor. And then so it's hard to determine which one of these is actually the deepest. And then that's what the optimizer does is it's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm your guide, right? I'm your Sherpa. <laughs> I'm standing at the top of the mountains. And then I have another Sherpa that's at the bottom of the mountain. And then we're, we're guiding you. And that's our job as the optimizer is to guide you and say, Hey, uh, you're actually, that one's not the deepest. You should go a little bit further. And there's actually one that's a little bit deeper. You should explore more or yes, this is, let's go keep going deeper. Right. And then, so the way that, you control this exploration within neural networks all comes back to physics. And then so within neural networks, within AI overall, uh, all of it in general, it all really comes back to and down to physics. If you uh, listen to your physics instructor when it comes to these things, they know a lot more about these things than anyone else, I guarantee you more than computer scientists, et cetera, because they have a deeper understanding of the actual limitations of these concepts, right? And how they actually work. And so within uh, how exactly this exploration process works, this exploration process works via a process called entropy, which is a part of the second law of thermodynamics. And then so the second law of thermodynamics says that um, exploration or, or entropy will work uh, via like sequences or rules, right? Meaning that um, heat will, hot will always transfer to cold. And then like there's order and disorder. Uh, and then so if you have high entropy, you have high disorder, high amounts of randomness. If you have low entropy, you have low randomness, low disorder. Uh, there's And then so within that, you can create a process called entropy-based exploration which is very straightforward. Right? You can control the entropy in the model. And then so like everything else within AI, we put the, we convert these into numbers and then we convert them into a probability number between zero and one, uh, just because our minus zero, uh, minus one and zero, or uh, minus one and one or zero and one, because that's just the most straightforward way to do it, right? <laughs> and then so uh, you just, translate whatever the number is to a number between zero and one, and then that becomes your entropy. So uh, entry, like if you have entropy of one, that would lead to high exploration, high randomness, right? If you have an entropy of zero, that'd be low randomness, low disorder, meaning that the model would not want to explore. So if you set the entropy to one, the model's gonna explore everywhere. You set the entropy to zero, the model's only gonna take actions based off of what it knows. And then so, that's kind of what you see here, and that's what's illustrated here as to how exactly this process works. And then so essentially by uh, starting off at one and then dropping down the entropy, you know, 1, 99, 98, 95, 90, etc., you 
start to learn more and more information about the environment as the environment gets explored more and then you get to terminal states, which is your ideal state. And then essentially this entire process is how um, entropy-based exploration works overall and what the optimizer is doing, right? So the optimizer is literally just controlling this exploration process. And then, so think of it that it has two levers that it can pull via this entropy process, right? It can either pull high entropy or low entropy, meaning it can say explore a lot or don't explore at all. And then that's kind of the level levers that it pulls, right? And then don't explore at all means just do what you already know and then take into account what you already know 100%, whatever that is. And then so by pulling these two and then controlling these two up and down, we can uh, get the model to behave in certain ways. And then so let's say that the model is going through our peaks and valleys, our hills in this instance, uh, and then it, it goes through here. So in this instance, it finds uh, this would be like one minus one on this uh, graph, what it looks like, right? Y one, uh, Z minus one. And then you would ask, is that like the uh, lowest point, right? And then if entropy is set to one, then it's gonna explore and it's gonna say, hey, no, I found uh, minus two, uh, y minus two, z minus one over here, that looks like it could be a better candidate. Uh, and then, uh, but if entropy is set to zero, it's going to be like, yep, <laughs> this is it, right? We're not getting any deeper than this. Uh, or even worse, it could be uh, at, uh, let's say, y two and z minus 0.5. And then if entropy is set to zero, it's going to be like, yep, this is it. <laughs> like, no deeper than this. Uh, and then if, it, if entropy was even set to like 0.1, it would find this like chasm right next to it right but since entropy is set to zero it's gonna be like no, no this is a valley this is good <laughs> and then so uh that's the danger that you run into within this right and then so that's just essentially how optimizers work and how entropy works at a high level so that doesn't answer the question and leaves the question why is atom optimizer so good within this right what makes atom so good within this process and the bottom line to me is it's subjective. <laughs> There's not an actual like uh, objective answer that has been found to this question. But to me, subjectively, the answer is very straightforward in that uh, the best optimizer for this process isn't the optimizer that 100% finds the most optimal solution 100% of the time, which is what a lot of mathematicians try to strive for, right? Like, so a lot of mathematicians hate that the atom optimizer is so good because mathematically speaking, it, like, you know, and you can tell 100% that it never finds the 100% most optimal solution. That's not like by design. That's what Adam does, right? Like it's it's suboptimal by design, um, and then within that, like that's where I think the magic of Adam in and of itself comes in is because of the fact that like it, by design it is suboptimal, and that suboptimalness is the the actual solution when it comes to finding optimums because you always want to have, you never want to have entropy at zero, like no matter what, right? Uh, even like, uh, and then so that's the problem with uh, algorithms that uh, that are capable of finding the 100% uh, absolute minimum is that they are, they'll set entropy to zero and set entropy to zero way too easily as opposed to Adam, which will almost never set entropy to zero, right? It's always going to say, explore something. I'm not 100% sure. And then that in and of itself, that impreciseness, imperfection is the magic. <laughs> and then like you people want to beat that out of it, out of these tools, etc. But I mean, we've seen it time and time again, like, uh, I mean, there's been thousands of mathematicians far <laughs> and people that are far better at me than me when it comes to these things that have challenged this and Adam always reigns supreme, right? Like, uh, and Adam always comes out on top. Like it's, I mean, even on paper, like Adam gets thrashed on paper by tons of other optimizers. There's tons of optimizers that will do and find a more optimal solution in 
standard instances or in some instances than Adam, right? <laughs> and then, but across all instances, when we're talking about generalizability, the most generalizable algorithm that you can possibly think of as far as an, uh, an optimizer, nothing comes, comes up and, and, and st like comes close to Adam. <laughs> and this has been years and years and years, right? Uh, and then it's because of the imperfect, like, Adam is imperfect and imprecise, and that is exactly why no other algorithm will come close to it, because all these other algorithms are dreamed up by mathematicians who are the reason why, why they're dreaming it up in the first place is because that impreciseness is what bothers them, but that's what makes Adam so beautiful. So that's why Adam is the best optimizer overall, and this is how optimizers work. If you like this type of content, please like and subscribe.